All right, what's going on, everyone? We got a lot to get into, so let's get started. Beginning with President Biden's State of the Union address last night, he hit on a few key aspects related to the war in Gaza that I thought were worth covering. He said, quote, this crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by the terrorist group called Hamas. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust and 250 hostages taken. Now, as I'm going through some of Biden's statements here, it's worth recognizing that I, I think this is probably the most critical he has been of Israel since the war began. So keep that in mind, and we'll come back to that here in a moment. He says, Israel has a right to go after Hamas. Hamas could end this conflict by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has an added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards, under hospitals, daycare centers, and the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. He said the war has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have so far been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. So again, probably the most critical that we've heard President Biden related to Israel and Israeli policy so far in this war. But all things considered, it's not that harsh. It just, I think it, as we're looking through the statements by President Biden in this speech, I think it shows that while there's a, a mixed feeling in the American public around support for a ceasefire or what the appropriate terms for a ceasefire would be and how to get more aid to the Palestinian people, when you look at the government leaders in the United States, it is essentially unchanged from full-fledged support for whatever Israel wants to do. That's a personal opinion. But if this is the hardest that President Biden is coming down on Israel in quite a while, it, it's kind of saying something. He said, tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. He said, no U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. Now, there were some additional notes. This was kind of leaked before the speech came out, so it was all across the news hours before the actual State of the Union. So we do have a handful of statements from American officials. Some said that it's going to take a number of weeks to get this thing into place, uh, saying that they hope that over time the United States will be able to turn this into a commercially operated facility over the coming weeks, months, or potentially even years. Now, there was a fair amount of pushback on this idea, this plan that's now in the works. This isn't this isn't an idea any longer. This is something that President Biden said is now in the works of, of coming to fruition. There was some pushback here. You've got Mustafa Barghouti, apologies here on the pronunciation, the Secretary General of the Palestinian National Initiative. He said, quote, it seems to be just another effort to divert attention from the real issue here, which is 700,000 people are starving in North Gaza now, and Israel is not allowing humanitarian aid to them or the rest of the Gaza Strip. And then Sigrid Kog, again, apologies for the pronunciation, of uh, the United Nations, the coordinator for humanitarian and reconstruction in Gaza, uh, welcomed the U.S. plans to provide sea access for aid and delivery, but stressed, I cannot, repeat, I cannot but repeat, air and sea is not a substitute for land, and nobody says otherwise, saying the existing land crossings are faster, safer, and more economical than a maritime route, this new pier, and airdropping attempts all across Gaza. So the major pushback here to the idea of a pier being installed in Gaza is not that it's a bad idea or it's not going to do anything. It's that it's going to be expensive. It's going to take a lot of time, weeks at the very least. And it makes it seem like Gaza is this completely isolated island where, where nobody can reach it except by building a new pier out to the sea or airdropping supplies in, when in reality, there are multiple land routes into Gaza that are controlled by an ally of the United States. So the major point of pushback here is that, hey, instead of recreating the wheel and coming up with all these unique and, and challenging and expensive ways to get aid into Gaza, some airdrops that can happen right away but not in significant quantity for a long period of time, or the pier that will be able to bring more and more aid in, but it's going to take a long time to get it together when the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is right now. According to the United Nations, there are people dying of starvation right now. So two weeks is a significant time to wait for a little more aid to start flowing in. And while the pier will be able to bring in more than the airdrops, it's nothing compared to what could be pushed across the land corridors that run through both Egypt, but mostly Israel. 
So again, kind of the major pushback here is that if the United States and President Biden really wanted more aid to be getting into the Palestinian people in Gaza, the way to do that is not through more airdrops or establishing a new pier, but to pressure Israel to allow more volume through the overland routes that already exist. And President Biden kind of hit on that, saying, and Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza and ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. To the leadership of Israel, I say, Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. So we'll see where this all shakes out. It looks like right now what the future holds is more airdrops, more on that in a second, and the building of a U.S. military pier that will eventually transition to commercial use to bring more aid into Gaza does not sound like at least right now, there's been any progress in the U.S. getting Israel to allow more aid via the overland routes, either through Israel or in the south by Egypt. Then U.S. Central Command, along with the Royal Jordanian Air Force, conducted two more humanitarian airdrops over Gaza earlier this week, one on March 5th, one on March 7th, carried out by U.S. C-130s. The first drop, they say, consisted of 36,800 meal equivalents in northern Gaza, and the second was 38,000 meals providing life-saving humanitarian assistance in northern Gaza to ensure civilian access to critical aid. I would expect those aid drops to continue for a while here. Again, we're looking at, at the very least, a couple weeks, probably, before this pier is built and more aid can come in via the sea. So maybe every 48 hours or so over the next couple weeks, expect more and more aid drops by the U.S., Jordan, and potentially others. Then we've got a little bit of news on the ceasefire negotiations ongoing in Cairo. It looks like Thursday, Hamas walked away without showing any real signs of progress. Now, Israel and Hamas, in this case, both blamed each other for the lack of an agreement after four days of talks mediated by Qatar and Egypt about a 40 to potentially 60-day ceasefire in Gaza. The Egyptian security sources said that talks that were taking place without an Israeli delegation in Cairo would resume on Sunday, the expected start of Ramadan, although that's not entirely clear if Hamas is, is ready to come back and continue those negotiations. Senior U.S. administration officials said that the onus right now is on Hamas to complete a hostage deal, and they attributed the delay to what they described as Hamas so far not agreeing to release the sick or elderly hostages. Then a Hamas official in talking with Reuters said that the United States was working in partnership with Israel and that such comments about Hamas not wanting to release the sick or the elderly were misleading. Hamas insisted that any ceasefire deal would include a process towards ending the war altogether. Now, one of the challenges here from the beginning of the negotiations is that both sides have drawn relatively hard lines in the sand about non-negotiable items. So Hamas, for their part, continues to say that Israel will leave Gaza forever. All Israeli forces out of Gaza and a permanent end of the war will be negotiated. Israel has said that Hamas will no longer remain in power and that all of the hostages will come home. You've yet to really see any sort of deal that it's hard to understand how a singular deal is going to accomplish both of those things. They're in contradiction to what the opposing sides want. Now, there have been some articles coming out talking about, and this isn't new, but there's a new article talking about it, a possible rift between Hamas leadership on what they're trying to get out of these negotiations and what they're trying to get out of this war. There was an article we talked about a few months ago kind of hitting on this exact same thing where they're saying that the, there's a disconnect between the local Hamas leadership in Gaza and the international Hamas leadership like uh, Haniye out in Qatar. And a lot of times these negotiations are happening with the external components of Hamas, not necessarily with they're having to go back and relay. Because these guys like Yaya Sinwar, they're not leaving Gaza, flying out to Cairo to conduct these talks, right? It's their, their, their message is being relayed to the Hamas leadership outside of Gaza. And it sounds like more and more there's a disconnect where those in Gaza want to continue fighting and exacting more concessions from Israel, while those on the outside are more interested in actually getting some sort of a pause in the fighting, be it a month or two months, while a longer-term ceasefire can be negotiated. We'll see how significant that rift is, or if it exists at all. Of course, that's, that's speculation just based off of how these negotiations have played out so far, but it's something for sure worth keeping an eye on. Then turning down to Yemen, where this week the Houthis launched their first fatal attack against a commercial vessel in the region. On March 5th, U.S. Central Command forces say they shot down one anti-ship ballistic missile and three one-way attack drones launched from Houthi territory towards the USS Kearney in the Red Sea. So that's 
Houthi munitions being fired at U.S. military vessels. Then uh, later that day, CENTCOM destroyed three anti-ship missiles and three unmanned surface vessels in self-defense. It looks like those had not yet been launched. Then on March 6th, an anti-ship ballistic missile was launched from Houthi territories towards the MV True Confidence, a Barbados-flagged Liberian-owned bulk carrier while transiting the Gulf of Aden. The missile struck the vessel, and the multinational crew reported three fatalities, at least four injuries, of which three are in critical condition, and significant damage to the ship. This is the fifth anti-ship ballistic missile fired by the Houthis in the last two days, over the period of those two days. Two of those anti-ship ballistic missiles impacted two shipping vessels, the MSC Sky 2 and the MV True Confidence, and one of the anti-ship anti ballistic missiles was shot down by the USS Kearney. So again, this is the first note, this is the first noted fatalities after the Houthis have been launching these attacks for months now against commercial and military vessels in the region. Fortunately, the United States and our allies have been able to, one, shoot down a bunch of the drones, missiles, and then intercept a lot of the unmanned surface vessels. And then the ones that do impact, very luckily at this point, had not caused any deaths. That changed. The Houthis just killed a handful of folks in this most recent wave of attacks. Now, the Houthis did claim responsibility for this, saying that the naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces carried out a targeting operation against the American ship. True confidence in the Gulf of Aden with a number of appropriate missiles. The strike was accurate, led to a fire breaking out on it. They said the Yemeni armed forces persist in upholding their religious, moral, and humanitarian duties in supporting the oppressed Palestinian people, and their operations in the Red and Arab Seas will not stop until the aggression stops and the siege on the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip is lifted. That's been the continuous statement from the Houthis at this point is they're going to continue striking commercial and military vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden until the siege of Gaza is lifted. So we'll see what they have to say when there is a U.S. built naval pier bringing aid into the Strip. I have a feeling that's not going to be enough and these attacks are going to continue. Then later on March 6th, U.S. Central Command said they conducted self-defense strikes against two unmanned aerial vehicles in a Houthi-controlled area of Yemen that presented an imminent threat to merchant vessels and U.S. Navy ships in the region. And then on March 7th, Central Command conducted self-defense strikes against four Houthi anti-ship missiles and one Houthi unmanned aerial vehicle in Yemen. They also say they shot down three UAVs launched from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen towards various ships in the Gulf of Aden. So there really hasn't been any slowing down of Houthi activity as of late. I did see some reports recently that the United States and our allies are becoming more and more focused on interdicting supply routes to Yemen. Say that, hey, Yemen is not building all these drones, anti-ship ballistic missiles, and USVs by themselves. They don't have the manufacturing facilities set up inside of Yemen to do this. These are coming in part or in whole from Iran. So the U.S. and our allies are finding more and more ways to shut down that supply route, which should over time, reduce the number of attacks that the Houthis can carry out. However, it's worth noting that the Houthis likely have a pretty significant stockpile of drones and missiles scattered all across the country in underground storage facilities. It's just they've been fighting a war for quite a while. It's not like when October 7th kicked off and Israel and Hamas went to war, the Houthis said, you know what we should do is get a bunch of those Iranian-made weapons and start launching them at commercial military vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. They've been acquiring those weapons for a long time. So while the U.S. and our allies trying to shut off that pipeline right now between Iran and the Houthis will have an impact in the long term, in the short term, you got to expect that these strikes are going to continue at this pace or potentially even increase. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if you're interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack linked in the description below. Substack is essentially a mix of a website and a newsletter. We've got some audio articles on there as well. We published three new pieces this week. We've got one talking about how China, Russia, and Iran harness American technologies in their weapon systems. One today that just came out talking about supply shortages in Ukraine and how that's affecting the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia. And then one earlier this week talking about Kashmir, which we call an intense flashpoint between two nuclear states. Again, it's all linked in the description below. Hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.